So we've been talking a lot about databases, um, and we've been talking about how to build them, how to run them, how to create businesses around them, but what about data? And what purposes does this data serve for us? Uh, so I want to just take a step back from kind of the technology itself for a little bit and talk about two things. I want to talk about how data has been changing businesses and how the rate of that change continues to accelerate and data will be continuing to change how we run our business and how we run the systems behind those businesses for many years to come. Um, and secondly, a, a trend that I alluded to earlier in the, the panel when we were talking about distributed systems and how I think that the, the distributed nature of our world is accelerating uh, quite quickly. So both of those are hype, it's true, but I also think that these are uh, these are things that are going to last well beyond the hype cycle. So the future is happening now. Insert hype moment here. Right? Uh, we, we are at a crossroads, I believe, where every business that does not operate on the basis of learning from its data and making better decisions is going to be outrun very quickly by other businesses that are doing so. And you can pick any number of examples, for example, um, Netflix. You know, Netflix has crushed block, uh, Blockbuster Video and many other competitors, and then they've moved on to crush other competitors in still other arenas. And a big part of their uh, secret sauce is quite simple. It's really getting the data about uh, what the world wants and needs and applying that in their business. <clears throat> this future where everything is data-driven in any company and any person that doesn't operate in a data-driven way uh, is happening now, it's happening around us as we speak, and it's been happening for some time. Uh, so I want to take the first part of my talk and kind of look back and see where this came from. Because I think it's very difficult for us to understand what's happening now, let alone in the recent past, but I think we need to, to understand to some degree to kind of predict where we're going to go in the future. And predictions are hard, especially when they involve the future, right? Uh, but I think there's some, some trends that we can see accelerating that are not going away anytime soon, and so we can uh, make some inferences about some of those things. There's this buzzword, uh, this is, is definitely hype, uh, it's called digital transformation. It's such a terrible phrase. Uh, <laughs> but in the world of business, people are talking about this all the time. And digital transformation is exactly the phrase that describes this process of businesses um, continuing to use data to enrich the way that they uh, interact with their customers in particular. Um, so one example of this, we used to take products to market very differently. We used to build different kinds of products and take them to market very differently. And I'm talking about in the physical world as well as the technology world, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, when I was a kid, my brothers and I had boxes full of Legos, tens of thousands of Legos. I mean, we must have had like 30 or 40 pounds of Legos. And uh, we got them from mostly secondhand, um, from other kids, you know, occasionally our aunts and uncles would send us Lego kits for, for Christmas and things like that. But generally, we got secondhand Legos for free or cheap, and we absorbed ourselves in these. I mean, we were in, inseparable from our Legos. And uh, we passed the, the long winter uh, uh, days away building stuff. And the reason that I, I, I did not realize this until much later, other kids didn't care about Legos anymore. The reason we were getting so many Legos is because uh, other kids were getting into television and video games. You know, this was in the late 80s and the early 90s, and these other forms of entertainment and education were exploding. Well, I grew up without television, I grew up without video games, uh, and I uh, had to walk to school, you know, miles in the snow, barefoot, <laughs> uphill both ways, and all that kind of stuff, too. Right? But, <laughs> actually, I was homeschooled. Um, but, you know, I, you know, looking back, um, it's clear that us being so uh, completely absorbed in our Legos was actually a side effect of Lego failing, because kids were changing, and Lego was not changing. Lego struggled. They almost went out of business. They turned it around, and what is Lego doing today? They're making mobile apps, making mobile games, making movies, and they use these things to promote selling breaks. I mean, it's a totally different business. It's been digitally transformed, right? Um, another example would be um, Starbucks. So Starbucks, I mean, you know, a cup of coffee is about as commoditized as you can get. You can get a cup of coffee anywhere at any time. Um, you can get a good cup of coffee or a bad cup of coffee. I'll leave you to debate amongst yourselves about which of those Starbucks is. But the point is that Starbucks, you know, having stores on every corner and so forth, um, you know, Starbucks doesn't compete on price. They don't compete on location. They don't compete on convenience. They don't compete upon the quality of their coffee. They compete something very different, which is data. 
Uh, Starbucks has incredible loyalty among their customer base. It's phenomenal. And that turns out to be the thing that another company can't just do. Another company can, can come into the market, duplicate the supply chain, uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, they can do everything that Starbucks can do, but they can't get that incredible customer loyalty. And the way that Starbucks built that customer loyalty was by offering a rewards program. And the rewards program gives you and me and everybody else who goes to Starbucks something nice. You know, it's a little something. It doesn't cost Starbucks a whole lot. Uh, but what they get in return is compounding the benefit of that. They get information about us. Right? Um, I'm not a, a, a Starbucks loyalty member, but I know a bunch of people who are. And Starbucks uses this to turn a coffee business into a data business. Right? Um, so their data becomes the real, the true barrier to innovation and competition in this space. The reason all of these things are possible, the reason it is possible for Lego to transform themselves from molding plastic bricks, and Starbucks to transform itself from grinding and roasting coffee, um, is that there is ubiquitous, cheap, fast access to data and getting answers out of that data. So we, this was not the case you know, in 1985. Um, a business could only dream about this. There were some businesses that were doing this very early, uh, you know, but by and large, this is a, a phenomenon that's cropped up in the age of ubiquitous computing, uh, post-web Fiato and cloud era. Um, and you could, you could get data about your business and your relationships with your customers, essentially at the speed at which those customer relationships happen. That is completely new and it's transformative. And what it has allowed businesses to do and what every business that succeeds must do, this is the new table stakes, is stop focusing on what they're selling and start focusing on what their customers want. Complete 180 degree turnaround, right? So data enables that. Without that, you're, you're either lucky or you're wrong. You're guessing. If you have data, you can be right and you can be fast. Um, and that is, that is really why we are all here because whether we are interested in the internals of InnoDB or whatever else that we're here for, our customers or our customers' customers are solving problems like this and building businesses and changing, transforming industries like this. Here's a friend of mine, Andrew Montalenti, who's the CTO and co-founder of Parsley. Um, Parsley is ostensibly a media analytics um, and customer engagement tracking platform. Um, what they do is they measure customer engagement in a way that reveals what those audiences' behaviors are and from that, they can infer their intent and their desires, their preferences. And so what Parsley sells to their customers who are uh, leading companies like the New York Times, you know, publishers, media, et cetera, what Parsley sells to them is not customer analytics behavior because that's been done before, Adobe, Google Analytics, et cetera, et cetera. What Parsley sells them is insight into what their audiences want to read. This is game changing. This makes those, uh, those uh, media companies able to understand what they should be writing. Writing, publishing, curating, how things are arranged on their homepage, which things come first in the feeds. Those are game-changing answers. And in turn, providing that capability to their customers makes Parsley absolutely indispensable to them. So just another example. You know, just being able to answer the question, what do my audiences want to read? That's a fundamentally different question than what are my audiences reading the most, right? The bad news is, <laughs> when the rubber meets the road, it's really hard to do this. It is hard to take a company that is focused on something like building Lego bricks and say, actually, the Lego bricks are just sort of a secondary, kind of an afterthought. What we really need to be focused on is learning what our customers want. It's really hard. It's a cultural change. It's a process change. It is it's woven into the technological fabric of that company, and if there isn't one, it has to be created. And then building these systems to capture this data, to analyze this data, to, to find, um, you know, to, to ask the right questions and get the right responses from that is really, really hard. And it requires everyone, again, to become a data expert. It requires something that we call data fluency. So this data fluency is a really important part of what we're all doing in this room in one way or another, whether it's you know, optimizing the performance of systems or delivering a better product for our customers. And it's so hard to build that you reach false summits along the way. You, know, you get part of the way there, and there's this temptation to turn back. And you're like, this is just 
Yeah, this is really, really hard. I don't, I don't see a, a path, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Why don't we just go back to vanity metrics? Can we just go back to Google Analytics and page views and clicks, please? And some companies do that. Others press on. Those who press on eventually find that they build the systems that allow them to operate much faster in the future. They build systems that allow them to answer questions that they didn't know they were going to need to ask. They build systems and capabilities and a culture inside of their company that thrives on this. And then the margin, the leverage on their efforts becomes that much higher. And everything they do is accelerated. Cycle times move faster. And speed is the only advantage in a business. Whether you are an incumbent in a space or whether you're a startup trying to break into a space, speed is your only advantage. If you are not moving fast and moving faster, then somebody else can. They will disrupt you or they will put you out of business. And you, uh, the only way to move fast with clarity and certainty is to know. And you need data for that. You need answers for that. So with data, you can run better, you can run faster, you can run stronger. Now, I've, so far, I've mostly been talking about how a business interacts with its customer base. And I've been giving examples of business to consumer and business to business, and how data can transform fundamentally what happens there in that intersection, that interface between the business and its customers. But this also applies to the business's internal operations. And the internal operations are the engine. They are the train. They are things moving on time. They are shipping software. They are operating systems. They are building um, uh, the, the back end and the platform on which the business operates. And it turns out, no surprise to, to you, I'm sure, that you can apply the same principles of data fluency and being highly data driven in everything to the way that your business operates and to your technical systems too. Um, and so in engineering, particularly, that's, you know, that's my chosen area of focus. And in engineering, we can apply this to how we run our systems. So I want to shift a little bit um, and talk about some, a, a word that has come into vogue a little bit recently. It's observability. Uh, we used to talk about monitoring. We used to talk about instrumentation. And these days, we're talking about observability. Well, what's the difference? Observability is a property of a system that allows you to inspect it from the outside, look at its inputs, its outputs, and its side effects, and understand what it's doing inside. Observability is different from instrumentation. You can instrument the hell out of something and get no insight into its operations. You don't have observability there. Observability is also not monitoring tools. Vivid Cortex is not an observability platform. Observability is not the microscope. It is the slide, right? Um, observability, again, is that process, uh, that, that um, a property of the system that we're trying to observe. Observability is also cultural. It's like DevOps and microservices, and Peter mentioned site reliability engineering. These are things that have um, phrases that make us feel like we understand what they mean until we get deeply into them and we understand that there's actually a huge body of thought behind them and a lot of culture. So observability is not just that the system is observable. It's that every time somebody reviews a pull request, they go, I, this is not good to merge because you've made a change and you did not build observability into that change. How will we know whether this change makes the system faster or slower? How will we know whether this, this change makes the system correct or fail? That is an, a fundamental part of your code. I will not approve this pull request until that's in there. It's a similar philosophy to testability. You can't bolt these things on after the fact. You can't bolt security on after the fact. And you can't bolt observability on after the fact either. So observability is, I would say, it's probably going to become a buzzword in the next handful of years, uh, but deservedly so. The benefits of observability is that you can move much faster. Ask any Vivid Cortex customer, and they will tell you that their engineering teams are shipping better code to production faster with fewer defects and less rework and less unplanned work because they can observe how their systems are running in production in a way that they were never able to before. Observability is also infectious. People get excited about it, and then they start, that's the first thing they do when they think about deploying a system or uh, you know, writing, changing some code. They think, how am I going to observe this? And when people see other people doing that, and they see people you know, being super ninja wizards and answering questions that they couldn't have thought about, then they want to build that into their stuff so they can be heroes too. So observability is this very virtual uh, cycle in the culture.
And when you have poor observability, the opposite happens. One axiom of observability is that where you have the least visibility in your systems, pretty much guaranteed that is where your big, fat, ugly, stupid performance problems are hiding, in plain sight. Um, and when you can't see them, then they bite you, and you end up having to do unplanned work and rework and redeploy and pull things out and take down time and explain to your customers and all of these kinds of things. So the data tier in particular, um, you know, I'm an engineer sort of broadly speaking, but specifically on the data tier, that is my passion and my focus. And the data tier is one of the biggest black boxes that we have in our systems. We have, as I discussed earlier, we have these large scale distributed systems, you know, it's a database, but it's running across five different technologies and 250 different servers, and it's running at high velocity, and it cannot slow down, and it cannot have hiccups in latency. Uh, come to Preton's talk later to, to learn about hiccups in late, latency and how they occur and, and pile up. And if they do, then we have a serious problem. Um, so wherever you have poor observability, it's going to become a compounding problem that bites you. And that is the, the problem that Vivid Cortex exists to address, is to help people understand, what are my production systems doing? They're there to do work. I should be measuring that work. The work of your data tier is to run queries and answer questions. Are you measuring those queries? Are you able to answer questions about whether all of your queries, uh, from the highest level, the eagle's eye view of your entire infrastructure, all the way down to individual queries on individual servers, are running with optimal efficiency and speed? And if not, then you will pay the costs. So that's the end of the distributed, uh, the, uh, the end of the, the Vivid Cortex uh, pitch slide there, even though it didn't have our logo on it. Um, so now I want to talk about where observability is going in the future and how this data-driven culture is going to carry us into the, the distributed future. So we have, I, I talked about how we have databases for data and data is for getting answers. And at Vivid Cortex, our mission is to empower our customers to unlock the potential of their data platforms, to achieve data fluency, to understand what their complex distributed systems are doing in production. These systems are increasingly distributed, and that is increasingly a challenge. It is a really hard challenge that I would posit we are not ready for today. Uh, we must get ready for it, and it will always outrun our, uh, our abilities, but we can make some progress on it. So how we used to change, uh, uh, build software has changed dramatically. We used to build software by compiling some code, making a binary, putting it on a server, and running it. And, then, and that was a single server system. And then we went to distributed systems. We took that binary, and we we put it onto you know, a handful of servers, and it ran in a distributed fashion. Um, and today, we usually think about distributed systems being distributed maybe uh, globally or across data centers. But SaaS has added an entirely new level of distributedness to the systems and applications that we're building. So today, you do not build um, everything that you need in your application. You build the core functionality that is special and unique to you and you leave the undifferentiated heavy lifting to someone else. It's on a different platform or, or something like that in many cases, but most often, some of the most critical functionality, such as payment processing, message sending, these kinds of things, are through SaaS APIs. So you consume them as an API. They're a service that you uh, consume from your application. You know, somebody goes to the sign-up page on your website, and you're gonna send them um, an email confirmation to, to confirm that their email is valid, that probably goes through SaneGrid. Um, if it's a, a, an, an app on the phone in their pocket, it's, uh, you know, it's gonna send them push notifications. Those usually come through um, SaaS services. All of these things that are just common and can be factored out of the stuff that we're all building, those are sort of moving to the edges and we are focusing more and more on the core of what we're building. And that core is what's unique and special about us. And um, you'd be foolish to build your own. I mean, I've built large-scale uh, email sending and receiving systems in the past, but that was before systems like SendGrid and so forth. Um, what, we, what we have kind of failed to realize, I think, culturally, is that we are now entirely dependent on these things. So I was speaking to uh, one of my investors who is deeply involved in one of the subscription economy um, uh, companies, and um, he, he runs a lot of engineering. And I said, well, you know, what do you depend on? And he named a particular payment processing uh, company. And I said, what happens when they're slow or down? And he goes, yeah, I mean, it's blocking for us. Our customers can't do what they want to do with this, with this app. And, and I said, well, you know, what have you done? Have you contorted your architecture? Or how do you deal with this? And he's like, you bet we've contorted our architecture. If the payment processor is slow or down, which it often is, um, then we have to, we have to abort 
And instead, we go to another SAS service and we ask whether this charge is likely to be fraudulent. And if it's not going to be a fraud, if it's not predicted to be a fraud, then we'll let somebody go ahead and do their transaction on the platform and we'll try it later. Um, and as a result, uh, on an average, at any given moment, they have $10 million backlogged of transactions that they have to have, haven't run. So talk about you know, dependencies on external services and the consequences of, of those. We have entirely new failure modes in these widely distributed services. And we also sort of culturally think that the boundary of our app is around the code that we've built and we run ourselves, but that is not true. Our app now extends out into Twilio, it extends into Braintree, it extends into SendGrid, and all of the other services upon which we depend. They are part of our app, just as surely as an external library linked into our C++ code used to be 15 years ago. But here's the kicker. It's a library that we have linked and compiled, hard compiled into our application or service. It's run by somebody else and it's shared. It's a shared platform. It's not, it's not something that we wholly have a single tenancy over. So it has high contention and concurrency and demand on its resources. And the only thing that we get is the API to you know, do whatever it is that we want to do. We don't also get the APIs for deep observability into that SaaS service. So we now have distributed black boxes at a scale that we have never seen before. Brian Cantrell wrote about this 10 years ago in a paper. It's a great paper. Please go read it. It's called Hidden in Plain Sight. And he observed that when you cannot monitor systems, you get big, fat, stupid performance problems hiding in plain sight. They're created at high levels of abstraction because of the abstraction, and you observe them at the low levels of abstraction, and you try and fix them because that's where you have visibility. But you cost them up here. So those levels of abstraction, that's a lot of what we get with SaaS services. Um, the second thing that he observed in the closing of that paper was that someday we're going to have to think about how we're going to do, um, he didn't say observability, but how we do observability in distributed systems, and it's going to be hard. That was 10 years ago, and boy, was he right. Uh, here we are. So these new dependencies create entirely new failure modes that we are just incapable of and unprepared to handle with. Um, running a little short on time, so I'm going to speed a couple of these things up. Um, monitoring. Monitoring, what we usually think of as monitoring in this world of distributed applications, really needs to be performance analytics. And analytics is taking large sets of data and asking questions about them and getting answers back. In the distributed future, monitoring cannot be centralized. Today, every, every monitoring vendor is centralized. They take some data and they put it into one place and then you can ask questions about it. And if you go and look at your favorite monitoring vendor's website, they talk about this distributed nature of these systems and the only way that you can answer questions about them is you need to consolidate, centralize, aggregate, you know, unify. There's a whole bunch of words, but they all mean the same thing. They mean taking a whole bunch of data and putting it into a silo. Now, if we accept that our systems already run at planetary scale, even if we didn't really think about it that way, and we think about this increasing into the future, is centralized monitoring going to serve the needs of the distributed future? No, it will not. We know how to build distributed analytics databases. We don't ship the data to the query. We ship the queries to the data. So in the future, we need our monitoring platforms to cope with this new reality and uh, you know, really get with the game. The monitoring vendors, there are generations of monitoring vendors, and every generation kind of you know, points and laughs at the previous generation and says, oh, I know, it's just a silo. You need a single pane of glass. You need unification or whatever. Here, have a bigger silo. No. Uh, that's not going to fly anymore. It's going to reach a breaking point very soon. So I don't know the full answer, but there are three things that I think are vital for distributed monitoring in the future. Given that monitoring really means performance analytics, the first is that each vendor, you know, vendors should not become worldwide and global because then they'll be good at nothing, right? Um, monitoring vendors, monitoring services, monitoring products, open source or closed source or business or, or free, whatever they are, all are going to need to do these things. They're going to need to be good at something. So where we have chosen in Vivid Cortex is a specialized at the data tier. That is all we do. We're not monitoring your Nginx. We're not all of these different things. We're telling you, what is your data tier doing? Um, and that's, that's one level. It could be horizontal specialization, it could be vertical specialization, right? Uh, but it can't just be all things to all people. It needs to be best of breed in some specific domain. Go really deep in that domain. 
The second is that we have systems, and those systems need to be viewed as a thing, and you need to have a zoom in, drill down view. So you need to be able to look at the 50,000 foot view and see overall, like what is my entire data tier across all of these different technologies, or you know, so let's get out of the data tier. What is my overall system across all of these different layers in the application stack? What is it doing as a whole? Oh, what's, what's that? That's interesting. That is what we need to be able to do in the future because systems are composed of parts and you have to be able to see and understand the system and how it's behaving and then go down to the part and understand what's going on there. And then finally, composability. Every monitoring platform, service, product, project in the future needs to be consumable by other things that are layered on, on top of it. So, for example, Vivid Cortex in the future needs to be possible for a system somewhere to be running analytics across Vivid Cortex at the same time that it's running analytics across New Relic, at the same time that it's running across Prometheus. And without that data being integrated, integration today means shipping data from one monitoring system to another, uh, that's got to stop. And so we've got to be able to operate as a node, as a leaf in this distributed tree of push down processing into a distributed analytics. So this is happening today. Um, there are people who are thinking about this kind of stuff today and building systems. Uh, Metdata is one. Uh, we talked about Elastic. Elastic is, is producing cross-cluster cross search, which is uh, towards this direction. Um, there's Prometheus, which has remote read support. There's Amazon. There's open. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, tracing projects in Amazon. Uh, just the fact that Amazon offers their data, you know, we'll give you a platform to run on it. By the way, you can see how it's running. That's kind of revolutionary uh, for most um, most uh, platform vendors. Um, there's uh, there's Open Trace, for example, the Open Trace initiative. So there's a lot of people thinking about this, but I don't think as an industry that we really come together and said these are the specific problems that we need to solve. And I don't have those answers for you. At our booth, we have answers about the data tier. So come on over. Uh, we monitor a whole bunch of the databases that you've been talking about in this uh, in conference. So enjoy the rest of the sessions today. Um, and come see me at the booth. I'll be hanging out there all day today and I look forward to it. Thank you very much.